from Brown University, a uh, PhD <coughs> from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. She's currently a lecturer in psychology and behavioral sciences at the University of New England in Armadale, Australia. She's the author of over 30 peer-reviewed uh, research articles. Her work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. She also currently serves as an associate editor for the Psychological Record. She's on her second stint on the uh, JF editorial board, as well as serving in review, reviewer capacity for a dozen other journals. She's past president of the Southeastern Association for Behavior Analysis, and she's the current co-coordinator of ABBA's Experimental Analysis Behavior Conference Program. Uh, she's also an excellent teacher and mentor, which I have some first-hand experience. I have to admit, when I first applied to uh, WVU, I had no idea who Liz uh, was. <laughs> um, but I consider it to be uh, one of the great breaks of my career to uh, have been invited to join and uh, accept a position in her laboratory. I think it's a, a testament to uh, her skill as a researcher and a mentor uh, that her, uh, so many of her students have been uh, so successful. So I think we're in for a good tutorial today. Liz's talk is Selection by Sci Scientific Consequences in Behavior Analysis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John. and thanks Adam for that lovely introduction. I was certainly lucky that Adam decided to come to WVU and work with me. So Selection by Scientific Consequences in Behavior Analysis. This is an exciting time to be a behavior analyst. Um, mature areas of research that we've been studying for a while like extinction and relapse and delayed discounting are bearing some interesting fruit in terms of identifying the underlying behavioral mechanisms that are involved in those behavioral processes. Uh, and also in terms of coming up with some evidence-based directions for interventions for the problems that are related to those behavioral processes. Behavior analysis is also making headway in new and different areas of research, like uh, social interaction and machine learning. And behavioral insights generally are receiving unprecedented attention from government, industry, and even Nobel Prize committees. There are more of us than ever. But as always, there are also challenges that we face in behavior analysis. We have a marketing problem, as we always have, uh, in an increasingly brand conscious world. Behavior analysis continues to be uh, attacked from experts in other fields with varying degrees of misinformation and uh, non beneficence uh, For instance, there are experts in education who would like to convince the world that consequences prevent learning through intrinsic motivation and therefore are a bad thing. There are cognitive scientists and comparative cognitive cognition experts who uh, reject mechanistic explanations of animal intelligence as overly reduct reductionist, regardless of the fact that they tend to do a better job explaining data than uh, less simple explanations. And there are uh, Biologists and neuroscientists like Robert Sapolsky who don't object to mechanistic explanations, they just assume that their mechanisms are better. In addition to these behavior analytic specific challenges, we face uh, more general challenges, the same types of challenges that academics everywhere face in terms of obtaining funding, managing our time, uh, doing work that has broader impact, uh, and dealing with decreasing college enrollment numbers uh, around the world. We also face the same challenges that other humans do in terms of uh, divisive and changing political climate, economic climate, actual climate, uh, and you know the inevitable heat death of the universe that sooner or later we're all going to have to deal with. <laughs> Fortunately, behavior analysts are uniquely equipped with the skills and expertise to overcome a lot of these challenges. Right at their core, many of the world's biggest challenges are problems of human behavior. We need to balance a sustainable food supply with sustainable biodiversity, uh, employ a growing workforce amidst increased automation and increased income inequality. We have to figure out how to combat a cul 
culture of instant gratification and its consequences like obesity, substance abuse, even things that seem like less of a big deal like chronic procrastination, uh, to name just a few. So these are all global problems that have their roots in the behavior of individual humans. Right? We haven't become an overweight society as a society. We are a society of overweight individuals, and it's at the individual level that uh, the problems emerged, and I hope that the solutions will be implemented. The systematic scientific approach to generating behavioral insights and to engineering interventions related to those insights is our best bet as humans for rising to meet these challenges. No matter what kind of behavior analyst you are, uh, on one level or another, in one way or another, that is what you do. You generate behavioral insights scientifically and engineer effective interventions. But most of you probably flew here and you remember what they say on airplanes about what to do if an oxygen mask appears. And you always ensure your own mask is secure before assisting others. Scientific activity is behavior. As behavior, it's subject to the same principles and modifiable in the same ways as any other behavior. Behavior analysts can and should, and I think very often we do, apply our scientific method, uh, our scientific methods to our own professional activities as scientists and practitioners. We have an obligation as well as an opportunity to put our own behavior under a microscope. So today, I'm going to apply the ideas from the related field of behavioral ecology to the behavior of behavior analysts to show how you can use them to guide decisions about what kind of scientist you want to be and to shape the future of behavior analysis research. After all, our work should be subjected to the rigor and scrutiny of other behavioral sciences. And I think that seeking out ideas other than our own is one way for us to grow as a field. So what kind of behavior analyst do you want to be? I think this was a different question 60 years ago, although I wasn't around to ask or answer it. Uh, you might say, I want to be a good behavior analyst. Probably, I want to be an employed behavior analyst. All of those things are still true. But today, when we ask what kind of behavior analyst do you want to be, or what kind of behavior analyst are you, the question really means, are you basic or applied? Over time, basic research in the experimental analysis of behavior and applied research and applied behavior analysis have developed uh, different patterns of behavior that are associated with it. Right? Uh, we publish in different journals, we seek different sources of funding, we work in different settings, we use different analytic approaches, uh, we even pursue different awards and honors, and with the possible exception of this conference, we go to different conferences. There's not a whole lot of overlap in how we do what we do and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the difference between experimental and applied behavior analysis has become so striking that it's uh, visually discriminable. I haven't tried this out, but I want to do a little experiment with you. I think the distinction is so visually discriminable that I bet you can tell where each of the figures I'm going to show you was published, either the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior or the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis without any access labels or identifying information. So here's the first figure. Um, by applause, who thinks this was published in JF? How about Java? <laughs> Fantastic, okay, right. Here's the next one, possibly a little bit harder. By applause, who thinks this was published in JF? Java? So some variability, this was a JF paper. Okay, this next one, by applause, who thinks this was published in JF? <laughs> that sounds like a lot of consensus. Anyone want to admit to thinking that it's published in Java? <laughs> this is a JF paper, one more. By applause, who thinks this is published in JF? How about Java? research output is uh, pretty discriminable, even when we strip it of its detail, the labels, and its context. Uh, it's pretty easy to tell whether something is applied behavior analysis or uh, the experimental analysis of behavior. And in 1991, as many of you may know, David Ryder 
published a paper in the Behavior Analyst uh, where he called this divergence between the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis speciation. So one definition of one type of speciation that comes from a dictionary of animal behavior, ecology, and evolution is this. The idea is that two populations gradually adapt to disparate environments where they accumulate differences in genotype and phenotype frequencies, then reproductive barriers between the populations evolve coincidentally and the populations become different species over time. Ryder argued that the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis are isolated and the researchers are isolated from each other in different natural environments with different natural contingencies. We face different requirements for survival, and as a result, we possess different skill sets. Ryder characterized the schism between EAB and ABA research as pitting good science against expedient practice. And if I were an applied behavior analyst, that might sting a little bit, particularly if I were an ABA researcher. But I don't know what the reaction was like at the time. What's more, Ryder argued, the schism is inevitable. Adaptive characteristics are byproducts of contingencies of survival, he wrote, which are established by the natural environment and not by proclamation. So if we decide that we don't want applied behavior analysis and uh, the experimental analysis of behavior to diverge as different species, we have, we have to change the natural environments in which EAB and ABA researchers exist. It's not just a matter of saying, hey guys, let's stick together and keep collaborating. So behavior analysts have contemplated the implications of Ryder's allegory uh, in a number of publications. And a few years ago, you've probably all heard Jack Maher's presidential address where he revisited this. Uh, as a community, we've examined the legitimacy of this claim, questioned the rate of speciation, questioned the inevitability of the schism. Is this really something that is happening? And we, and including Ryder in the original article, explored the limits of this allegory because, of course, speciation in a natural population is a little bit different than uh, the divergence of two related fields of inquiry. But what I'm interested in is this question of whether speciation is a bad thing, right? If it means the extinction of experimental analysis or of applied behavior analysis, that it's a problem that at least one group of us need to solve. But that's not necessarily the case. It might be an opportunity for us to embrace or something else. So in considering the question of whether speciation is bad for applied behavior analysts, uh, this fox and hedgehog argument is typically invoked. I guess there is a poem written by the Greek poet Archilochus uh, that includes the sentence that goes something like this. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. I assume it's more poetic in each and Greek. <laughs> the argument here is this. Most applied behavior analysis involves the fairly straightforward application of simple principles of reinforcement or punishment. You figure out what is maintaining a particular behavior, what type of reinforcer, and then if you want to see more of that behavior, you uh, reinforce it. If you want to see less of that behavior, you remove the reinforcer. Uh, and applied behavior analysts have had a lot of traction doing this a million different times in a million different ways. That makes applied behavior analysts hedgehogs. Now, the argument for why this might be a problem is that natural selection requires adaptation. If the science of the experimental analysis of behavior and the technology of applied behavior analysis part ways, what happens when that technology becomes outdated? Well, I want to point out that things seem to be going okay for hedgehogs so far. They're not going extinct. Uh, and Ryder in the original article actually considered uh, some other fields where a relatively basic uh, pure science discipline deviated from a relatively applied discipline. And one of those that he contrasted was mathematics and accounting. So in this example, accountants would be hedgehogs. And accounting has adapted over the duration of its existence to new types of clients, 
new software, new tax codes and other laws. And it's done all of this with math that you could probably do on an abacus if you had enough time and patience. Accountants don't really need to worry about what modern pure mathematicians are doing. They can get by with fairly ancient mathematics. They will be in trouble when people stop needing to balance their books or pay taxes. I think accountants are probably okay. By the same token, applied behavior analysts who uh, disregard the modern science of experimental analysis of behavior aren't going to be in trouble when EAB takes off without them, if that happens. They would be in trouble when no one ever has any more behavior problems. So again, I think the conditions are right for applied behavior analysis to survive on its own as a field. So how about EAB? The passage from the 1991 article that gives me pause when it comes to the experimental analysis of behavior is this one. So Ryder wrote, survival always hinges on the ability of individuals to make the demands, to meet the demands of the natural environment, so far so good, and then insufficient numbers to propagate their own kind. Experimental analysis of behavior is outnumbered. If you look around at this conference, my guess is we're probably outnumbered by applied behavior analysts, maybe 5 to 1, maybe as much as 10 to 1. And then when we go home to our own apartments, we're outnumbered by other experimental psychologists, cognitive scientists, behavioral neuroscientists, and other types of researchers in our own departments. So not only are we outnumbered, but EAB is graying. I think the average age, I don't have data on this, but my guess is that the average age of the average eab -er is going up, or at any rate, it's not going down. So I'm concerned about the reproductive health of the experimental analysis of behavior. But I also wonder whether there's a better metaphor than foxes and hedgehogs in this allegory. Okay, specifically, I wonder whether MacArthur and Wilson's 1970 RK selection theory is a better metaphor. So RK selection theory is based on the Verholst model of population dynamics. And as a model of population dynamics within ecology, it's been superseded. It's always been criticized uh, for its empirical validity, uh, for its potential implications and things like that. But I think, at least for, for now, the idea still has some didactic value. And the idea of our case selection theory is this. Species exist on a continuum from R selected at one extreme to K selected at the other extreme. K-selected species thrive in equilibrium states, and they're characterized by slow development, relatively high competitive ability, they're good at doing things, they're often good at doing lots of things, uh, late reproduction, large body size, things like that, uh, often characterized by high parental investment. So uh, a K-selective species, sperm whales are a good example, tend to have relatively few offspring, they invest a lot in those offspring. They spend a lot of time nurturing them and uh, developing them. And so each offspring that is born has a fairly high chance of survival. The other end of the, the extreme, our selected species are sometimes referred to as opportunistic species. They are characterized in the extreme by high fecundity, small size, fast maturity, uh, and no or limited pair bonding and parental care. So a salmon is a good example. They lay many thousands of eggs. The expectation is not that uh, a lot of those eggs will turn into salmon that are going to make it to the next breeding season, but that's okay because the salmon parents don't put a lot of time or effort into any individual egg. So low parental investment and uh, high numbers. So a low success rate is okay as long as there are enough uh, salmon to get you to the next generation. What does this have to do with behavior analysis? Well, I want to argue that the experimental analysis of behavior is, or at least should be, a relatively K-selective species. Most EABers have or are in the process of getting a PhD. Many of us do postdocs. We take a long time to mature. We also tend to work in labs that are relatively small uh, with high parental investment. 
from our academic advisors. And you can see from people like Adam, who are so phenomenally successful as behavior analysts, uh, that that strategy, I, I certainly feel like I invested a lot in all of my students, uh, and I'm happy to see it pay off. By comparison, ABA is relatively far slanted. If you think about someone who might be working full time as a registered behavior technician, it's possible to get RBT certification very quickly. Many people at this conference are BCBAs who completed coursework master's degrees, and even among applied behavior analysts with PhDs, they're more likely to have been part of a very large lab uh, or a behavioral army with lower average parental investment from their academic mentors. So I'm not saying this to suggest that applied behavior analysis is inferior to EAB in any way. All I'm saying is that per student or per behavior analyst, on average, becoming an ABA takes less time and involves, on average, less parental investment from our academic parents compared to EAB. All right, because this is a squab tutorial, I want to talk a little bit about the math behind our case selection theory and Verhulst to population dynamics. So the equation that applies here starts like this. In the Verhulst population model, population growth, uh, dn by dt, uh, so that's the change in population in a year, a season, a breeding cycle, whatever it happens to be. So n is population, t is time, so that population growth or change is a function of total population, and R is max growth rate, so how quickly can they grow in principle, and it's inversely related to K carrying capacity, so in principle how big can this population get. So if we graph a population over time, we can start with some initial parameters for R, K, and N. Uh, and then apply this equation to simulate uh, what different types of populations might look like uh, to graph population as a function of time. So our selected species have a relatively high maximum growth rate, and as a result, population fluctuates a lot, like this. In bad years, the population will drop a lot, as long as it doesn't drop below two, assuming standard sexual reproduction, uh, and it's the right kind of two, it can bounce back very quickly. So that's why these are opportunistic species. If there's a bumper crop of extra resources available, the population can grow very quickly, uh, and they can come back from bad years similarly very quickly. In contrast, here's what the population change for a K-selected species might look like. So the only difference between those two uh, data series is that the uh, maximum growth rate for the K-selected species is a tenth of what it was for the R-selected species. And the K-selected species has a lower maximum growth rate, which means that the population doesn't grow as quickly as an R-selected <coughs> species, but it also means that that population is less dependent on what happens in any single year, so it's less vulnerable uh, in bad years to threats. So what does this mean for EAB? Well, one of the things that it means is uh, that a K-selected species with a low maximum growth rate uh, can sustain a small population over the long term, uh, whereas our selected species, if there's any threats, uh, if they had as low a population as this, they'd be wiped out and there's no coming back once you get down to zero. But as long as the environment is fairly stable and the population doesn't reproduce at our selective rates, a K-selected species can exist in small numbers indefinitely. So I think the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis can survive independently as separate species, maybe in, with different numbers and different approaches to training, but uh, will persist. I'm not worried about our long-term survival, either of us. Um, regardless whether our speciation continues and regardless whether that ends up being a good thing or a bad thing, I do hope our symbiotic relationship continues. So 
behavior analysts do a lot of research that's not clearly either pure basic research or pure applied research. And we have what I think is an unfortunate tendency to label all of that research translational. There's lots of writing about behavior analysis uh, and translation where we extol the virtues of translation and how it enables basic research to have impact and ensures that evidence-based best practice occurs. Uh, young behavior analysts are advised to do it. Journals, including JAB and JAVA, encourage translational submissions. But all of this has occurred without any agreement about what translation is, much less what constitutes a translational research output. I think this does a disservice to translation, right? The process of turning research, good research, into expedient practice and vice versa is one that requires pure basic research and pure applied research and other types of research. But all research that is neither pure basic nor pure applied is not translational. So it's mislabeling some of this work in a way that doesn't facilitate translation. And it also does a disservice to behavior analysts, uh, particularly young or less established ones, who do research that is impure in the sense of neither pure basic nor pure applied. My sense as someone who doesn't do empirical translational research, but as a reviewer and a colleague of people who do that type of work, is that what often happens is someone does a project, they think it's good work, so they submit it to JAB or Java, it goes out for review, and then the comments that come back, quite separate from whatever the scientific review is, are something like this. This is interesting work, I wonder if it's really translational. Or, I see how this is translational, but I wonder if it's translational enough to call it translational. Or, I think this is interesting translational work, but I wonder if it would be more appropriate for the other journal. There has to be this whole discussion about whether this is translational, whether it's translational enough, whether it's the right kind of translational. And that's separate from, is the work of sufficient quality to be published, and is this the right place to publish it? And what that does is it delays publication of that type of research, and I don't think it encourages the diversity of publication in the way that journals mean to when they say, please send us your translational research. So, this is a problem of taxonomy, the basic translational applied taxonomy that we use and perhaps overuse in behavior analysis is problematic. So Trinity Subramaniam and I, in a paper that's just come out in Perspectives on Behavior Science, proposed a new taxonomy of behavior analysis. This is a basic applied spectrum that's divided into five tiers based on whether the research subjects target behaviors, study stimuli, and data collection setting were convenient or socially important after Bear, Wolf, and Risley, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Our objective with this taxonomy was a more specific, concrete classification system that organized behavior analysis research along a basic applied continuum, and I'm not sure we were 100% successful doing that. Um, one that can identify knowledge gaps in emerging areas of research, and one that could potentially serve as a guideline regarding what to publish where. All right, returning to the notion of convenience versus social importance. Uh, this issue of social importance uh, from Bear, Wolf, and Risley has received some uh, criticism of late in Pritchfield and Reed and other sources, and I think that criticism is valid. Social importance is a fuzzy concept uh, that perhaps relies on the intentions of the researcher and an operational definition that relies on what the researcher wanted to do or believed they would do or hoped to do is not entirely satisfactory in a behaviorist discipline, I don't think. So what Trinity and I did was apply a standard of substitutability. In other words, could you replace the subject with a different organism, use a different behavior, change the stimulus or the setting, and still answer the same research question or make the same scientific contribution? For example, if you think about a lot of um, JAB research uh, that uses pigeons pecking differently colored key lights for access to grain, you could replace the pigeon with a rat, replace the keys with levers, uh, replace the grain with sucrose water, and you'd still make the same scientific contribution. The uh, training procedures might have to be different. The uh, 
effect size might end up being different, but the substance of the scientific contribution will be the same. By contrast, if you're studying smoking cessation in pregnant women, if you exchange the smokers who are the subjects for children with autism spectrum disorder or the cigarettes for sips of juice, you've changed the research in a profound way. You're not making the same contribution anymore. So those subjects, uh, behavior stimuli and settings are not substitutable. So this is a spectrum with five tiers. Tier zero is uh, what you might consider perhaps pure basic research where everything is convenient or substitutable, right? The subjects are readily available, easy to care for, easy to motivate. Uh, there are established best practices for husbandry, which I think is true even if you're dealing with a convenient sample of undergraduates. There's a high degree of internal validity and the idea is uh, high experimental control. The target behaviors selected in tier zero research are easy to establish and modify. They're low risk, low cost. The stimuli include antecedents that are simple and abstract, easy to perceive, and perhaps unfamiliar or inconsequential to the daily functioning of the subject. So you could substitute a different stimulus without impacting the rest of the subject's life. The consequences are generally pre-established. If you think about when was the last time you saw a functional analysis that uh, confirmed that pigeons will peck keys, that uh, grain functions as a reinforcer for key pecking in a JM paper, it wouldn't be a good use of journal pages or author's time. Right? And the setting is designed to minimize potential extraneous variables and permit unadulterated if synthetic observations. So for instance, if I want to study gambling in pigeons and I develop an animal model, generally what I'm interested in doing is study, studying a particular aspect of uh, gambling processes. I'm not trying to duplicate a, the conditions of a casino in miniature in the operant chamber. Tier 1 research produces knowledge to solve a specific problem for a particular client. And this is where Trinity convinced me that uh, you can't have socially important behaviors, stimuli, or settings unless they're socially important to someone. So the research subjects might be the clients themselves, those smokers or those children, or they might represent some aspect of a client and serve as a proxy for them. So if you think about animal models of particular clinical populations, we would consider those to be socially important. Also, if you think about subsets of convenience samples. So you might be interested in studying the behavior of new parents, but new parents with newborn children are often not too happy to come into a lab and uh, participate in your experiment on top of everything else they need to do with their, their newborn child. Uh, so rather than asking new parents to come into a lab themselves, you might identify a subset of college students who share particular characteristics with new parents. Maybe they're especially exhausted, or maybe they have a particular reaction to uh, the sound of an infant crying, and then study that. Tier one, so tier one research has a client, either the research subjects themselves or uh, an animal model, but it uses convenient or substitutable behaviors settings so that the functional relation being studied can be specified as clearly as possible. Tier 2 research tests and refines behavioral technology under relatively controlled conditions. You have a socially important subject or client, you've got a mixture of convenient and socially important behavior stimuli and settings, and the idea is that there's something about the situation that is removed from the naturalistic <coughs> situation uh, and modified for improved experimental And then tier three is what you might consider pure applied behavior analysis research, where the subjects are or represent those who benefit directly, so they're a client. And uh, the research is constrained to examining behaviors that are socially important in their usual social, social settings using stimuli that were chosen because of their importance to man and society after their Wolf and Risley, uh, rather than their importance to theory. Then we took it a step further with a fourth tier that we labeled impact assessment. So this is research that estimates the utility and cost effectiveness of an intervention, specifies how it could be optimized for widespread use or incorporated into public policy. Like 
Tier three, the subjects, behaviors, stimuli, and settings are all socially important. This research differs from tier three in its emphasis on population level effects. So uh, we reason that impact assessment has to be sort of a step further than pure applied research because the protocol, whatever you're doing, has to have been used in situ before you can evaluate whether it's effective. So that's the spectrum. I want to return again to this issue of substitutability to point out that it's, it's fuzzy in a different sense than social importance is fuzzy. It's not based on the researcher's intentions, but it's also not based on topographic features. So to give you an example, here's a paper uh, published in 1961. Hernstein demonstrated uh, matching in <coughs> JR relative and absolute strength of response as a function of frequency of reinforcement. So this is a paper where pigeons pecked pieces of plastic in, with uh, different stimuli that were represented vis visibly for access to grain uh, in operant chambers. This is tier zero research. The year before, in American Psychologist, Skinner published a description of some research that he done during the Second World War about pigeons in a pelican. Like Hernstein's experiment, this involved pigeons pecking lighted pieces of plastic with different visual stimuli uh, in an opera chamber-like setting. But whereas Hernstein was demonstrating matching, something he could have done just as well with rats or humans or different responses in different settings, uh, Skinner was training pigeons to guide pelican missiles. So I'd argue this is tier three. You couldn't substitute pigeons for another organism. They were selected specifically because of their small size, because of their homing capabilities, things like that. The stimuli also represented particular stimuli outside. That was what determined how the pigeon was going to navigate towards a particular target. And the, the setting was designed specifically to, and setting and behavior were designed specifically for use in the cone of an actual missile. So this is tier three versus Hernstein's tier zero, even though they both involve the same subjects doing the same thing in response to similar stimuli. What's more, uh, tier zero and tier three are kind of pure basic and pure applied research, but uh, beyond that, there's not really a strict ordering system. A lot of the research you might consider to be basic might be classified as tier two. So if you think about drug self-administration with a genetically modified rat uh, that represents a clinical population, we classify that as tier two because the rat represents a particular client and the drugs that are used to stimulate are also uh, socially important. You couldn't exchange one drug for another without changing the nature of the contribution. Similarly, some research that you might think of as traditionally applied would be tier one. So a lot of stimulus equivalence that's done with particular target populations, for example. In developing this taxonomy, Trinity and I classified 177 articles from six behavior analysis journals. We wanted at least two issues of each journal. Uh, we selected the journals that are published by SAAB and ABAI. We wanted at least 25 uh, articles from each journal. We were able to agree on about 85% of them and classify them as between tier zero and tier four, and the remainder that we weren't able to classify were mostly commentaries, book reviews, and things like that. The distributions of tiers for each journal were about what you would expect. JAB skews low tier, lots of tier zero and tier one. There's more variability in the psychological record and the analysis of verbal behavior lots of research classified as other in the behavior analyst, which I think reflects an inability of our classification system to deal with conceptual articles. We had initially hoped that we would be able to cover all of behavior analysis. I think we did a better job classifying empirical research than conceptual research, but as a first step, that's something that I'm happy to live with. And then Behavior analysis and practice and the journal of behavior analysis. We have lots of tier three research. 
But here's the same data graphed a slightly different way, but the six journals on the x-axis and then the y-axis represents the different relative distributions of uh, each tier in each journal. I think it, it sends the same message. Lots of tier three, that pure applied research in uh, behavior analysis and practice in Java, the applied journals, and more variability elsewhere. So here's the same data graphed a third way that shows where we publish what. This graph is going to show proportion of each type of research published in each journal. So rather than looking at each journal and asking what percent is tier one, tier two, tier three, et cetera, we looked at all of the, I looked at all of the tier zero research and then looked at what proportion of that was published in each journal. Some of these results are informative, but not especially shocking. For example, most of the tier zero research was published in JF or Psych Record, and it was generally not published in the applied journals. And for tier three, vice versa, it was, uh, largely published in Java and behavior analysis and practice, and relatively little of it was published in JF or Psych Record. A lot of the tier four and other research appeared in the B your analyst, which is now perspective of behavior science. One thing that kind of surprised me is that tier one research gets published in JF. So the research that we classified as tier one most mostly appeared in the same journals that uh, research classified as tier zero. And then tier two research was all over the place. So we can simplify this even a little bit more to come up with an evidence-based decision heuristic. So imagine you are that young, less established behavior analyst who is about to embark on a career in translational research, and you're doing something that is not pure, right? Not obviously uh, experimental analysis of behavior or applied behavior analysis. You want to decide, should I publish it in JAB or Java? Should I submit it to JAB? So this is the same data graph the same way, except I've removed all of the ABAI journals. And a pretty clear decision heuristic emerges. And if you've got tier zero research, send it to JAB. Tier three research, send it to Java. If it's tier one, send it to JAB. And then send it to Java if it's tier two or tier four. Although if it can be construed as verbal behavior, you might want to go to the analysis of verbal behavior for tier two. Conceptually, you probably want to go to perspectives on behavior science for tier four. So I want to show you one more potential decision heuristic that uses the ideal free distribution to shape the future of research. The ideal free distribution is a theoretical dispersion pattern in which individuals that occupy higher quality habitats achieve the same average fitness based on the access to resources as those that occupy intrinsically poor quality habitats. So if you've got a relatively small number of organisms in your population, you've got two patches, and those patches are uh, equally resource rich, uh, four animals, you'll get two in each patch. You have 12 animals, the next breeding cycle in the population, they will still distribute themselves evenly between the two patches, you have six in each. But now imagine that the bottom of the lower patch has twice as many resources, whether that's food or mates or protection or whatever that happens to be, twice as many resources as the top patch, you can have twice as many individuals. So this is an idea that behavior analysts have been trading back and forth with behavioral ecologists for a long time. And it can be summarized this way. Go where the food is and your competition can also be summarized quantitatively, because this is a swab tutorial, I want to show you a little bit of that. So quantitatively, you can represent the number of foragers in each patch as M1 and M2. The ratio of foragers in one patch to the other patch is going to be equivalent to the ratio of resources in one patch relative to the other patch. You can measure deviations from predictions of 
the ideal free distribution by adding two free parameters. And those of you who are familiar with SQUAB and EAB uh, probably recognize that this is the generalized matching law with slightly different uh, variables. So it's mathematically equivalent to matching with deviations uh, related to bias and sensitivity. And behavior analysts, especially Bauman and Kraft, have used uh, this equation to uh, successfully apply the ideal free distribution to group choice, especially with humans, in a variety of ways. We can use it as a strategic decision-making tool for research. So imagine you are a young behavior analyst and you come to the end of one project and need to decide what you're going to study next. Based on your interests, your skills, uh, what you are capable of doing, you've narrowed your options down to two, maybe hypothetically delay discounting and generalized matching. You want to decide what should I commit to over the next couple of years. So you might go back and look at the, if you're a JAB type person, you want to publish in JAB, you might go back and look at articles published in JAB between 2015 and 2017, uh, and you find that there were 25 articles uh, published that used keyword A, and only five that used keyword B. So if you're thinking about that uh, matching relation, the ideal free distribution, this is a ratio of five foragers in topic A for every one forager in topic B. So all else being equal, you should study topic B because as a field, it's wide open. But except maybe you want to do more than just publish in JM, you might also be interested in pursuing some kind of funding. And it turns out that uh, active NIH funding to JM authors is not allocated equally in these two batches. Um, there's roughly $10 million of funding that has gone to uh, delay discounting, and $1 million, as far as I can tell, of active NIH funding that is that is currently allocated to someone studying matching. So 10 times as much NIH money goes to topic A, but there's only five times as much research if A is delayed as counting and B is matching. So if you want both NIH funding and JF publications, the decision is clear, go discounting. All right, I started with a Skinner quote, and I'm going to end with a quote from naturalist E.O. Wilson. Blind faith, no matter how passionately expressed, will not suffice. Science, for its part, will test relentlessly every assumption about the human condition. Behavior analysts don't have a monopoly on behavior principles. Ideas from ecology can and should be applied to our work and our own behavior in productive ways. So, if you're a student figuring out what to study, go where the reinforcers are and the competition is you train others and you want your program to survive and thrive, go forth and multiply, but maybe titrate your growth rate in accordance to your carrying capacity. And if you're ready for a new taxonomy of behavior analysis and you want to help make it happen, go to my website and sign up to get involved. <laughs> but know that whatever the function, whatever the future has in store for the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis, and whatever kind of behavior analyst you are, for the time being, we're all in this together. Thank you. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. We're out of time, but I'm sure Liz would be happy to answer questions if you want to come up and talk to her. Thanks.